Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, Radio, Online and your smart speaker. Coming up, that new report that has found just one in four of us think the NHS is working with confidence in the health service at a record low. We'll take your calls on that shortly. Asylum chaos. The Home Secretary orders a meeting with church leaders after it's revealed the Clapham chemical attacker, Abdul Azidi, was granted asylum despite lying about his faith. And hope for first-time buyers, lenders launch 1% deposit mortgages, but critics fear it could cause a housing crash. We'll look at that a little later as well. And, of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question. Would you pay more tax to help fund the NHS? Lines are now open. 0344 499 1000. Text 87222 or on the socials at Talk TV. First, let's get the latest news headlines with Nadira. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak's pledge to stop the boats has taken a serious blow. New home office figures show a record number of migrants have crossed the English Channel this year. 4,644 people have made the journey so far. This is a record for the first three months of a calendar year. 338 people arrived yesterday alone. Meanwhile, there are growing concerns of an ever-growing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers quit yesterday. Robert Halvan became the 63rd politician to say he will not stand in the next election. He was joined by the Armed Forces Minister, James Heapy, who also resigned. It triggered a mini reshuffle for Rishi Sunak. Chief political correspondent for The Times, Aubrey Allegretti, has told Talk Today that his days are numbered. You've got all sorts of candidates vying behind the scenes, people like Cammy Badnock, people like Grant Shapps. Uh, James Cleverly is a sort of dark horse. People don't talk about him as much, but he probably would be somebody who would go for it in the future as well. So all of that kind of manoeuvring and anticipation is already happening now. Over in Germany, at least five people have been killed in a coach crash. The Flix bus service was travelling from Berlin to Zurich on the busy A9 autobahn when it veered to the right and fell on its side. There are reports that others were injured. A black box data recorder has been recovered from the ship that crashed into a bridge in Baltimore, causing it to collapse. The search for six missing people has now ended, with rescuers presuming they're all dead. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says it will be a while before things get back to normal. This is going to be a long-term journey for our state to recover. But if there's something that I know that has been on full display today, uh, we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And we are going to make sure that as a state, we are going to get through this together. We are committed to getting through it together. And we will be in, uh, we will be in consistent and constant communication with the people of the state. Public satisfaction with the NHS has hit a new record low. A new survey found just one in four people were happy with services last year. Most said they were concerned about waiting times and staff shortages. And Katie Price says she wants to educate young women about how damaging plastic surgery can be to the body. The former model is insisting that there's nothing worse than young women getting fillers in their early 20s and says she's deterred her own children from going under the knife. That's all for now. Now's the weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, a real mixed bag of conditions out there this afternoon once again as we continue on the unsettled theme. We've seen rain across parts of the north and west this morning, as you can see on the earliest satellite and radar picture, some heavy downpours across the southwest of England and Wales. And those outbreaks of rain are continuing to move further northwards, breaking up into showers as they do. Some more showery, lighter outbreaks across southern Scotland this afternoon, northern Scotland as well, wet and windy. And for parts of Northern Ireland, there will be sunshine and showers, as there will be across England and Wales later. Some of the 
showers are likely to be heavy and thundery, especially out towards parts of the west. Temperatures will be around average for the time of year, highs of around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, some of the showers continue across the west for a time, but they mostly fade away, and it will be a mainly dry and clear night across Scotland and Northern Ireland, far north of England, with a patchy frost. Meanwhile, across parts of England and Wales, there'll be yet more rain spreading northwards across many parts of central and southern areas of England and Wales, and wet and windy weather also spreading to Devon and Cornwall. Both these areas of rain will be spreading northwards through tomorrow, so throughout the day it will be wet and it will be very windy, especially from the southwest. Temperatures will still be around average for the time of year as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Uh, welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. Now, what is your biggest fear? Spiders? The dark? Commitment, maybe. Understandably, though, for many, it's the thought of someone they love getting ill. In the UK in 2024, there's nothing scarier right now than a health issue. Rishi Sunak, by his own admission, has failed on his promise to fix the NHS, and we all suffer the consequences. NHS waiting lists. We have Will... not made enough progress. You failed on that pledge. Yes. Because you said NHS waiting lists will fall. Uh, in fact, they are slightly coming down now, that, but well, the waiting list is still that. nearly half a million yeah. more than it was at the start of last year. Yeah. You accept that? that? Yes, and we all know the reasons for that. Uh, what I would say to people is, look, we've invested record amounts in the NHS. More doctors, more nurses, more scanners. All these things mean that the NHS is doing more today than it ever has been. But industrial action has had an impact, and that's why we've been working very hard to bring down the people waiting well, Prime Minister, let's have a look at those figures. Seven and a half million people in this country are waiting to be treated. You heard that correctly. More than a million appointments were cancelled last year. Doctors went missing for 38 days over pay and working conditions. It's a grim list. Now, when it matters, when your life is in danger, the NHS is supposed to be our saviour. World beating, they tell us. But is it? Cancer care and accident and emergency are often held up as examples of its excellence. But this just is no longer the case. We've got the highest cancer death rates out of any country in the G7. And last month, 45,000 people waited in A&E for more than 12 hours before seeing a doctor. I was one of them. This goes way beyond a few shocking headline statistics. Every single step of the healthcare in this country is broken. That 8 a.m. scramble for a GP appointment. If you're lucky, you might get a phone call in two weeks from a doctor you've never, ever met. The six month waiting for a hospital referral. And then the 18 months or even two year wait for that much needed operation. Now, not long ago, of course, if you were pushy enough, if you knew the right way to speak or were friends with a doctor, you knew the person to send your complaint letter to and had time to pester, you might just get around the failing system and get looked after. But now even the sharpest elbowed middle-class mum can't find a workaround. Most people now with a bit of spare cash simply go private. If it costs 60 quid for a video call with an NHS doctor, but via some Silicon Valley app, then so be it. The problems are plentiful. We now export well-trained doctors at an alarming rate to other countries, or we simply lose them to the private sector and have to draft in foreign workers to plug the gaps. Our healthcare system really is broken. And politicians tinker with healthcare at their peril. But our treasured NHS has been insulated from criticism for too long. And it's partly that culture of silence that has allowed this situation to deteriorate to where we are now. Let's not forget, by the way, the entire system comes at a cost. An eye-watering £181.7 billion a year. It's not surprising, therefore, that just one in four people are satisfied with NHS treatment and delivery. To use a 20, 2024 phrase for a 2024 problem, we're trapped in a toxic relationship with our healthcare system. It's a simple question, but with many answers, I'm sure. But cutting to the chase, are you satisfied with the NHS? And here's a further question. Would you pay more on your tax to fund it properly? Well, open the lines on this one now, 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222 or, of course, on the socials at Talk TV. I'm delighted now to be joined by journalist and founder of Simple Politics. Tatton Spiller is with us to chew over this and a few other stories. Tatton, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Nice to see you. Um, 
I mean, this one, since we've all been alive, this merry-go-round of the NHS debate has always been there. Do we pay more money? Every government, including this one, will say, actually, if you look at the books, we are paying more, putting more into it than we've ever put into it. And yet we still have this backlog. We still have a broken system. And there's no doubt about it. When the figures show that that many people are unsatisfied, we really have got a problem. We've got a massive problem. But, you know what, before we get into the problems... I want to talk about the good stuff. Because two years ago, I got sepsis mm -hmm. and the ambulance just came and blue lit me to the hospital. There's no wait for the ICU. And the doctors and nurses in the ICU saved my life two years ago. Yep. Right? I'm, so on, when bonus, it... I'm on bonus time right now. I'm on bonus time. Because of that. Because of that. Because of what happened. And millions and millions yep. and millions of people are alive right now because of the treatment they've got in the NHS in the last few that years. That is true. And many, many people are in hospital right now getting excellent care True. because of the good work of the NHS. So, we can talk about the problems. All I wanted to start off with... The good, the, the good the stuff. Good stuff. The, the stuff. But, of course, the, ar the arguments would always be, well, that's, that's true, and I've got some examples exactly, as you've just quoted, of some, some real excellent care. Uh, the argument goes that there would be many more people with a positive outcome if we had a, a system that wasn't broken. So... Everyone agrees. You know, Jeremy Hunt says that we need to reform the... You know, he's put in four billion, I think, on to, 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 to make it better. Wes Streeting, the Labour Health Secretary, says that he's not going to pour money in. Mm. He's going to reform it from the inside. That 180 billion you're talking about is... People seem to agree it should be enough. And in the current, current system, if yeah. you got 20 billion more and made it 200 billion, would that... Would it make, Would any, it make difference? any difference? Yeah, yeah. Because it's not just about funding. Now, a lot of people feel that, it, that it, it, it's, it's, it's being drained yeah. by people. We haven't got the money in there. But sometimes it's hard. A new machine might cost a million, two million pounds. True. And if we don't have the machines now, if it's a brand new machine, then suddenly the government has to pay however many trusts yeah, need yeah, these yeah. machines. So to be better, we need to pay more. And it's only when you sit in a hospital... I mentioned about being in A&E uh, about a month or so ago, um, and that long wait. And when you're sitting there, you're looking around at everything, you know, every light bulb that's on all day long, every pair of rubber gloves, the, the sanitising liquid, the amount of personnel... You know, this is at 3 o'clock in the morning. You're still seeing... You know, it's obviously fewer staff around, but there's mm. still a lot of staff around. You're thinking, wow, every hospital... This is just one little corner of a big hospital I'm talking about here... And it's just one location yeah. of all the ones around the UK. And that's just the running costs. I mean, these things cost an arm and a leg. I mean, we get that. I think the biggest problem seems to be a shortage of staff, a shortage of doctors, a shortage of nurses. There are tens of thousands of vacancies and we can't fill them fast enough. And that might be about funding. But you're talking about the light bulbs. If your procurement means you're paying £15 for a light bulb yeah. or the cost of changing it costs £15, then you haven't got the money for the doctors. Yes. And so they're on strike, and that money could be, if you wanted to pay them the full amount they asked or enough to bring them back, that money could easily be saved. Everybody agrees that there is wastage within the system, and that was something that specifically this survey found, mm. that people were frustrated with the system. And I think it found that roughly 40% would be happy to pay more tax for the NHS. Yeah, I mean, roughly that's the 40 interesting wouldn't. bit, isn't it? If you did pay more tax, as you rightly said, I mean, it, it, it's not just the money, it's the sort of the system itself. Mm. But do you change that if Wes Streeting, who is in all likelihood going to be the next mm -hmm. health secretary and the first uh, Labour health secretary of the next government, um, is he going to do the kind of Blair thing? You know, we just bring in some more private sector into this. That's a swear word for many people. We'll be talking to a GP a little later who will not be happy to hear that. We'll also talk to one of the authors of this report. But some argue, well, that's the only way. That's the only way you can in at least initially begin the process of sorting it out, is to get a few people to go elsewhere. Get a few people to go elsewhere, sure, but if you bring privatisation into the NHS, and it is, it is a huge part of it now, outsourcing things to other places, that creates more managers. And yep. people say, we don't want more managers. And then they say, oh, we'd love some more of that sweet private yeah, yeah. action. And um, 
then they need more managers. Every government says we don't want more. They were going to have a bomb that phrase bonfire of the quango. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't have a bonfire of the quango. They get rid of the previous government's quango and then they just start another quango with their own mates and people they trust in it um, and call it something else. But it's essentially the same quango. Let's move on uh, to another story. This is just broken in the last couple of hours. Pub the police are looking again at claims that Angela Rayner broke electoral law over the sale of her house. This is something... I've kind of slightly lost track of this story because she had a house, she, mm -hmm. it was her address and it had a different address on a form somewhere and mm -hmm. should she have declared it, would that have meant that she... I, I can't... Either way, she's accused by some of not being completely straight. She says, I've done nothing wrong. We called the Labour Party. They said, look, it's not an investigation, it's just the police looking again. Mm -hmm. Apparently that's different to an investigation. I don't know in whose language, but... There we have it. Raina is yet again in the spotlight over a council house. She is. And the Conservatives are desperate to make something stick. She's been quite quiet for a long time, Angela Rayner, and I don't know why... Which is unusual. Which is unusual for her. Like, like she's a big firebrand of a, of, of a politician. And the Conservatives want to bring her down. Yep. And this tax story was huge for a bit and capital gains tax and switching things. And, um, and then the police went, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. And so now the Conservatives say, ah, but what about the electoral law? Mm. Is that, well, I think like a million students are registered to vote in both places. And it's illegal to vote at that's your parents' right. house or and, and university. university yeah. But it's, you can choose which one you do. Yeah. So if she's registered twice, it's, I don't know if there's a suggestion that she voted twice. That would be illegal. Listen, I'm no electoral law expert. Is it, look, I, I don't know whether... I, I've got a feeling... I'm not going to defend somebody who's done something that, that might be wrong, particularly if you're a politician. It, you know, the bar should yeah, be slightly yeah, yeah. higher. I, I, I'm not sure we're talking about the next Watergate here. You know, I don't think for one <laughs> I second... Think we that, are. I don't think Rayner is going to be in the dock on this one. There's no, there's going to be no Netflix drama based on a normal council house in Manchester. <laughs> it's, not going to, it's not going to happen somehow. But you're right. And a lot of people say, well, when, when Starmer gets in, he won't keep her there as Deputy Prime Minister. But, of course, he won't have a choice because of the way the Labour Party She's works. elected. Yeah. She's elected into that position. So, Which, of course, happened you know, previously with, um, with Corbyn and... Uh, who was he? Who was Corbyn's deputy at the time? Oh, you've put me John on the McDonald. spot. John No, they were a nice pairing. They, they loved they, each other. They yeah. quite, quite loved each other. But of course, you find yourself in that position where you can't get rid of your deputy. Um, talking of uh, strange things going on in cabinets, the cabinet reshuffle. I'm loath to really use the word reshuffle. There's a couple of junior ministers. Uh, it's not like we've got a new chancellor, a new home secretary, but we have got two gone. The 63 MPs now who've said we're not going to stand at the next election. Mm -hmm. That's a big number. Um, this is, it, I mean, Rishi's headaches happen now by the by the minute. So I don't know whether this is just, you know, is, is it a by-election? Is it a resigning MP? Is somebody legged it for the hills? Does he care anymore, even, do you think? Oh, he cares. Do you think he, he cares? really cares? I was watching him yesterday at the liaison committee, and he got was... a bit angry at one point. He got angry, he got passionate, he got... He, he was... He's into it, and he is up for this fight, right? To win. To, oh... To not do badly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think even he thinks he can win. Uh, could he be? I mean, if they're talking about under a hundred a hundred MPs at the moment, he could. He he would be up wanting more like over two hundred. Yeah, he yeah. is. He is going to fight this and this reshuffle. Do you know what? Like, I watch a lot of the Commons and these people before one in the Commons, like. Nurs Ghani does well. Mm -hmm. Kevin Hollenrake, a lot of people have seen for the first time because he was in charge of the post office. True. Uh, and he, he performs yeah. quite well. So it's, 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 it's pretty competent people moving up to other jobs. I mean, it makes no difference. It's not going to make not, any difference. Not, not, not because uh, cause the Rishi Sunak's doomed anyway, but because no one else watches the Commons. It's just me with the Commons live stream on. Those, I'm, the watching, yeah, 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 yes. I'm the only one yeah, watching. Yeah, yeah, I'm the only one watching. And and there's only five minutes of five months of Parliament left, so there's not much legislation time. If uh, if if Ghani wants to bring in yeah, a yeah, new yeah. a new bill, there's not much time for that. I think the only interesting thing was Jonathan Gullis coming in as a deputy chair. Yeah. Now, deputy chair is a like the most junior thing. It doesn't really mean very much. Don't forget Lee Isn't Anderson. It, there's more than one there. deputy chair as well. Isn't Hundreds there? of one them. One of those. Like, they're all they're all yes. deputy chairs. Yeah. yeah. And um, but Jonathan Gullis recently said uh, on Politics Live that he wasn't going to go to reform. Yeah. And clearly now Rishi Sunak wants to 
bring him in. Bring in the Gullis. And, and, uh, and unify the party with the right and the centre yeah, 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 and whatever. Yeah. Yeah, he's been getting some stick on social media in the last day or so uh, because somebody imposed a, a, a seagull's head on uh, on a picture and called him Jonathan Seagull, Seagullis. And he the apparently wit. got very upset about it. He's a nice guy, Jonathan. He comes in He here. is. I've, I've, um, I've, I've been on with yeah, him Yeah, many, many yeah. times. Uh, but, of course, the minute an MP says, oh, you know, take that down, well, that's just red rag to a bull, mm. isn't it? So now it's going viral and all the rest I of mean, it. I mean, Seagullis isn't particularly cutting, is it? It's not the yeah, it's not no. the greatest bit of satire, is it? But you know, it sort of half works, okay. I suppose. A um, couple of lighter ones to finish on. Uh, the, the statue of Prince Philip must be torn down. Uh, <laughs> can we have a look at this statue? This is a, a statue that was done. It's not. It's not a. There it is. I mean, it's dead ringer, isn't it? Who's that? You could ask a hundred people. They go, it's Prince Philip, isn't Prince it? Prince Philip, without doubt. The thirteen-foot sculptor called the Don. Uh, was erected outside an office block in Cambridge four years ago with the plaque commemorating the late Duke of Edinburgh's time as Chancellor of the University. And now people are saying, look, you can see the two of them together there. Uh, is which is which? Is that Prince Philip? I can't tell which is which. It's uncanny, right? I mean, look at that. It could be either. We should do a phone-in just based on that one. Um, I think leave it up there. It's become a talking point. Uh, one of my favourite stories, however, of the day, which I find, you know, interesting and funny but genuinely disturbing, is the comedian Ed Gamble, who has swapped a hot dog for a cucumber in his adverts because he was advertising his tour and there was a hot dog on the poster and Transport for London decreed that because it has fast food on it, and they won't allow fast food to be advertised on any of their billboards, he had to take it down. Well, now, even the Chinese wouldn't try and get away with that. But apparently over here, that's how we roll. I don't know how many hot dogs the Chinese eat. Um, <laughs> but we have a genuine, a genuine problem with people being overweight. We the, do. The, the, the huge numbers, and we were talking about the NHS earlier, yep. the more we can cut smoking and the more we can cut you know, being over, people being overweight for whatever reason, the less burden there is on the NHS. True. There is talk about, in Parliament, the talk about banning junk food advertisements yeah. uh, before the watershed, right? And that's, and that's got mostly cross-party support. Lots on the right of the Conservative Party speak out about it. Yep. But the concept of banning junk food advertising is largely agreed by a democratic but elected even, House of Commons. Yeah, and even if you don't agree with it, I mean, you could, see, you could see the arguments, but that's not an advert for fast food. That's just a picture of a bloke with a hot dog. Well, because he's advertising it. I don't think any kid's going to look at that and go, you know, we have to have hot dogs now because look, there's a It's comedian. a mighty good-looking hot dog. I mean, I get it's that it's not advertising. It's a beautiful hot dog. And actually, I think the cucumber's funnier because it's so obviously not a cucumber. I think putting the cucumber there makes it... Is that not a cucumber? Well, that he's eating when he's covered with oh, stuff. Oh, I see, and, that he's uh, eating, and then, right, and, okay. then, and then... Yes. So I think that's quite a nice visual joke. I think it's quite quirky. Uh, that, that, yes, you're probably right. That's actually kind of works better in a curious way. But it was just a hot dog. You know. Oh, they sure. Did, they did, the TFL boys didn't like it very much, so they made him take it down. Um, listen, Tatton, it's great to see you. Lovely to Thank see you. Thank you for coming Thanks in. Soon. Tatton Spiller with us here on Talk TV, coming up after the break. Confidence in the NHS plummets to a record low as public, the public grows frustrated with long waiting times. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back. I'm Ian Collins. Now, satisfaction with the NHS has fallen to an all-time low. Just one in four people are satisfied with the health service and the treatment that it provides. This is according to a report from the King's Fund and the Nuffield Trust. Public confidence is at its lowest since polling began in 1983, and the difficulty of seeing a GP was the biggest source of frustration. Joining me now is Danielle Jeffers, one of the authors of the report, and Dr Bob Gill, an NHS GP. Good afternoon to you both. Um, I mean, Danielle, first of all, I guess you sort of baked this point into the to any survey, but it, it's much like if you ask people, are you satisfied with the levels of traffic on our road? Most people will say, not really. Are you satisfied with the NHS? So many negative headlines about health at the moment. It's understandable. Many people would say, not really. So how do you extrapolate the authenticity, if you like, from people who are just thinking off the top of their heads. So these results, I think, reflect a real worry across the country at the moment about getting care for um, for themselves or the loved ones. So many people will have responded to this survey thinking either long waits they've already experienced, long waits for their family, loved ones, or speaking to members of staff who they know who work in the NHS and know how hard it is at the moment. I think we know that it's a real um, result because if we look back just um, five, ten years ago, satisfaction with the NHS was much higher. So if we go back to 2010, 70 percent of people said they were satisfied with the NHS, which is a huge drop in just 14 years, just to just 24 percent. Yeah. And you mentioned GPs there. Um, we'll, we'll speak in a moment to a real living, breathing GP, um, which is always fabulous. Uh, but it was, that was a particular area of concern from people you spoke to. Yeah. So in recent years, we've seen a real drop off in satisfaction with GP services, potentially because they've not been able to access um, services in quick enough for themselves. So um, we know that there's more appointments than ever in, in GP, but we know that there's still a struggle because of increasing demand to get in to see a GP when they need to. Mm. Um, but it wasn't only uh, in general practice that people had a big question mark over the NHS. No, so it was across a range of services. We also ask about a &E services, dentistry, in hospital, out of, out of hospital appointments, and they're all seeing really strong drop-offs in the last few years of satisfaction, and also with social care as well, which is closely linked with the NHS. Just 13% of people are satisfied with social care services too. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a, a steamroller, if ever there was one, waiting to come around the corner even faster than it already is, I sense. Um, let's bring in uh, Bob, uh, Dr Bob Gill. Good afternoon to you, Bob. Um, I mean, this is your, it's what you've done all your professional life. You are at the coalface of, of, uh, of, of our medical system, of the NHS, as a, uh, a GP. You're also an author as well. Um, what do you make of it when you hear these results? Are you disappointed but not surprised? How did you react? Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, there's a, legit, a legitimate problem in accessing services. We've had the NHS that has suffered relative defunding over the last decade. We, in fact, have a manufactured crisis. We've lost half the bed capacity since the 1980s. We are struggling to keep hold of staff. Uh, there's growing waiting lists which predate the pandemic. And what the government have been engaged in is manufacturing a crisis to reach this very point, a destruction in public confidence, and then people will be softened up for accepting more of the market reforms that have got us to this situation in the first place. So, some would say, Bob, that's... Uh, I mean, I can see on paper why it might look that way, but some would say it's a bit of a conspiracy theory. If you speak to a minister or a, an ex-minister or anybody that works closely, even in the higher echelons of the NHS, uh, certainly the people I've spoken to, and I've certainly put that to them, even off the record, simply don't recognise this, that analysis, and certainly don't see it as a deliberate attempt. They're not in any way defending incompetence, and for some people that's actually what we're dealing with here, but they don't, not recognising necessarily that this was a managed decline. Well, let's just look at staff retention and the, the strike action that's been taken place. Doctors have suffered up to a third real terms cut in their wages. There's a hemorrhage of staff out of the NHS. For the price of two to three billion pounds, this could have been solved. Instead, the government is throwing money at other, uh, such for example, the pandemic response, even the Public Accounts Committee said this was a huge catastrophic waste of money. Up to 35 billion was spent on a failed pandemic response. So. You know, the government, when it wants to spend money bailing mm. out the banks or throwing money at their friends in the private sector, there's no limit. There's always a magic money tree. But when it comes to solving a relatively simple problem of pay restoration, the government refuses to do that. And whilst they're crushing uh, doctors and nurses staff salaries, they're introducing a whole new parallel workforce of physicians, associates, physicians, assistants mm. who have barely any training will be being paid more than doctors and further degrading the quality and the safety within the NHS. So if this is not deliberate, then it's gross incompetence. But you just have to look at the series of legislation that has been passed, culminating in July of 2022. The Health and Social Care Act effectively created 42 new public-private partnerships called integrated care systems, which are based on the American model which is about profit extraction and not the delivery of health care. Uh, some would say it's based on the French model as well, but, I mean, we can have that discussion another time. We'll come back to Danielle in just a second, uh, but I did want to ask you on that point, Bob, if we can. Um, this issue of funding, uh, the government will say we've never put so much money into the NHS, whether it's gone to the right places or, you know, whether it could have been spent better. You're spot on about wasted money during the pandemic, by the way. But their argument broadly would be that there is so, there, it's eye-watering the amount of money that's gone in and it's going to continue that way. Does it need, in simple terms, just more cash? Does it need a change of system? Uh, the more money is a diversion. If you look, we need to look at where the money is going. For example, the running of a marketized NHS is sucking out, you know, up to 20% of the NHS budget is being used to run this market, the outsourcing market and the bloated management bureaucracy that you talked about earlier on in your program. Then we have the toxic debt liability of private finance initiative. The public were asked to borrow 11 billion from the private sector and we're going to pay back the nhs will pay back over 80 billion yeah so it's not money going in it's the money being bled out of the system to service toxic financing to service the market bureaucracy and to serve it service the profits 
of the outsourcing giants. Well, yeah, and, and wherever it's going, you're absolutely, again, spot on. The PFI, I mean, that that's a, could be a whole discussion for... It should be on the front page every day. It's almost criminal what happened in some of those areas and some of those contracts which we're locked into for decades, it seems. Um, let me just put the point about funding uh, to you, Daniel. Daniel Jeffries is one of the authors of this report. Was there anything you were able to ascertain in your research about whether people are willing to pay more for... Uh, a more efficient, uh, a more satisfactory health service? Yeah, so we also ask about funding in our survey. So the majority of people who we asked said there was definitely a funding problem within the NHS. And then we also asked about tax and funding for the NHS. And just under half, so 48% of people agreed that the government would, should increase taxes to spend more on the NHS. There were also about 40% of people who said we should keep it the same. Actually, a very small percent said we should make it the taxes smaller and spend less on the NHS. So quite an overwhelming message that we should at least keep it the same or increase it. There it is. Uh, listen, Danielle, thank you for your time. Bob, thank you for yours as well. Great to speak to you both. That's Dr Bob Gill and Danielle Jeffries. He's a GP. She was a co-author of that report that we're discussing here about the lack of satisfaction in the NHS. Let's take some comment from you on this. Shirley calls us from Hampshire. Uh, what are you thinking, Shirley? Afternoon to you. Um, oh, I'm fine. Um, in general, they talk in millions. I'm thinking just as me, as a little person on my own, okay. considering that I have lived with the National Health all my life. I did state, uh, I told you a uh, person just now, that I, I, as a child, had an operation before there ever was a National Health, so I don't know how that was paid for. But regardless of that... All my life has always the national health has been there, and over the well ever since COVID, I think things have really gone downhill. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I had my own NHS dentist because when COVID came along, he decided he'd retire. So that meant when. I was able to get, I had to get a private dentist, which I'm going to now, sure. but only go once a year because I don't know how much it's going to cost me each time I sit in a chair. But in every aspect, as I look at this, our country now, the care is not there, yeah. regardless from old people. Unfortunately, some poor souls are not as active as I am. I mean, I'm 82 and I still live on my own, do my own thing. I'm very lucky and I don't, uh, sure. uh, uh, you know, say that I'm not. Do you think, Shirley, that this is about paying more into the system? Is, well, would would that be paid. the... Is that the short-term answer or is this we just about paid. how we run this system? Um, it, it, it's those who deal with the money. It's not us, the little people. We've paid our way in yeah. our life through the National Health. Sure. Because our parents started... I provided, my husband provided, and now you sort of think to yourself, well, why did we bother? You sort of think, they don't care about us. We can all meddle along. Hospitals are being downgraded. One of our local hospitals is going to lose its accident and emergency uh, facility. Um, and you sort of think, well, that means another, another area is going to have to go another sure. 20 miles to go to another hospital. Yep. It, this is just in my area, so what's happening in other areas, I, I don't I know. I think you will probably find it replicated in many areas. Listen, Shirley, uh, you sound fantastic. Impressed to hear you're 82. Uh, you sound in great health as well. Thank you for that call. We'll take some more comments. 0344 499 1000. Would you pay more for the NHS? Is that what it's all about? I think, by the way, when Labour, and it looks as if when rather than if, Labour uh, come into power at the uh, tail end of this year, uh, and West Streeting is there with the medical abacus having to crunch the numbers. Um, stand by for kind of Blair Mark too. I think we will see overtly a more, um, a, a greater, deeper relationship with the private sector. Uh, possibly it might be disguised in all sorts of funky, uh, newfangled language, but I think ultimately that's the direction of travel, it seems. Uh, we'll take more calls on that shortly. Now, let's move on to this story. The Home Secretary, James Cleverley, has ordered a meeting with church leaders after it was revealed that the Clapham chemical attacker, Abdul Azidi, was granted asylum despite lying about his Christianity. Files published yesterday show Azidi was allowed to stay in the UK after a reverend supported his application. And photos of Azidi's baptism 
have since been released. But it comes after reports suggest that he was dishonest about his faith. Questions are now being asked about the use of religion in asylum cases. Speaking to Kevin and Alex earlier, the Reverend Michael Corran suggested that most cases are in fact genuine. You see through people and you have to be caring and compassionate. It doesn't mean you turn them away, but you don't always believe them. But you can help someone. You can try and feed them and you can try and find them housing and maybe some health care. That doesn't mean that you support their claim to be in the country when you know there's been a, a, a drastic criminal history to that person. And the idea that he had to be escorted to make sure that women in the congregation were safe is quite appalling. Well, I'm joined now by the journalist Steve Dew Jones, who works for Article 18. That's an organization raising awareness about the persecution of Christians in Iran. Um, Steve, nice to have you with us. I mean, just, just give us your wider take on this idea that, you know, the quickest way to get your asylum claim rubber stamped is just to pretend you've become a Christian. And if you become a Christian, there's no going back to places like Iran uh, because life would be a little tough. Uh, and that's a ruse that's being played out by the day. Is that true or false? Um, it's pretty. It's a pretty complex issue. I think that um, there will certainly be people who who see it as a way in which to gain asylum. Certainly, uh, at the same time, I know that genuine conversions are taking place. Uh, both of those who, before they arrive here or elsewhere in Europe or elsewhere, uh, and also when, when they're here. So I think it's a it's a complex issue, and it's it's a bit tricky to. Uh, put it all into a little, a little box. Yeah. I mean, if you were Columbo looking at the, the, some of these cases, and I, I get it, you know, people, of course, convert every day around the world in the way, you know, people change mobile phone contracts, people change their religion, and that's happened since year dot. Um, and in most places, you can do that with little or no controversy whatsoever. But I suppose our suspicions are somewhat spiked when someone has rowed over the channel, arrived here, have no uh, specific way of demonstrating the authenticity of their backstory or their case. So nipping down to the local Baptist church and having a bit of holy water uh, put onto the uh, the forehead is is the easiest way to do it. And I, I think most people would conclude that that's probably what is happening to maybe the majority of these cases, even if one or two are legit. Possibly. Um, I think that the... The judgment for that is a tricky one, and I think that that's, that's being played out in the courts and also in individual churches um, up and down the country. Um, I think there's, a, there's an interesting dilemma that the courts have, which is, you know, who is best placed to judge the sincerity of a conversion? And I, I would suggest that arguably it is the, the church leader, probably. Um, so I can completely understand why a church leader's testimony would be given weight uh, in an asylum yeah. hearing. And I think that makes sense. Um, at the same time, it is for the Home Office to judge, not just on based on someone's um, professed conversion, but also their whole case. And actually, I, I would take issue with what you said earlier about um, this guy's document showing that he was lying, because I'm not sure it necessarily shows that. I think often what you find in asylum cases is that there is a certainly a perception um, from the judge that the person may not be honest and there can be many reasons for that but I think it's it's not necessarily 100% sure that he was lying albeit certainly he committed a terrible act which um, you know uh, wouldn't suggest that he was telling the truth but at the same time I think it's not not 100% just based on the yeah. documents and even the fact that he committed this thing doesn't suggest that the conversion itself no, but was... No, he, he'd, he'd committed, you know, other fairly nefarious acts before as well, so that, you know, this was, wasn't that, necessarily... That's, that's true. This that's wasn't true, necessarily think... somebody who had a, a, a exactly a track record of being upfront and decent. That's true, although, although I think, you know, there are many of us who, before a, a conversion, might commit such uh, terrible acts and then... Uh, would be changed. And, and obviously, in this case, it doesn't appear that he was changed, no. but uh, judging judging from his actions. But at the same time, I think it is possible. Um, I'm not saying it's definitely the case, but I think it is possible, even in spite of what he did, that the conversion could have been genuine. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that then he still did something bad afterwards. But for whatever reason, I'm sure that 
um, he and lots of other refugees come here very traumatized. Um, so I'm just saying it's, it, it's possible. I'm not saying that it, it was. Well, certainly... I mean, anything is possible. But I think you you might be in a, a minority of about one to think that this guy was probably a legitimate practicing Christian. That, that's that's possible. I, I, I just think that it's. I think it's too easy to to say that um, because people do bad things uh that their their conversion you know was not genuine when it was actually i think i think what's what's missed in this conversation is is the potential trauma that um these individuals go through not least coming over here by boat because there are actually no safe legal routes to the uk from for example iran i'm sure that there there are from certain other countries but but i think that the yeah i think that it's it's a bit too easy to just put everyone into a um paint them in a negative uh, way. And I think one thing I'd, I'd also like to say is that I, I really appreciated the comments of a, a Baptist spokesperson at the Home Affairs Committee hearing recently when he he cited the the consequences of the rhetoric is actually, it affects the church members the most. These people who are trying to go out of their way to welcome refugees, which may indeed be why some choose to then convert because of the welcome they've received and it affects them the most when then they are lambasted for being gullible yes. um, or whatever. When actually all they're trying to do is is to help people. I, and I, some I, of those, yes, I, I, and some of them might actually be legitimate, and some may be false. But, I, but it's, I think it's it's I, very complex. I, I've no doubt of the motivation of, uh, of the average Christian that that wants to assist somebody in in that respect. I I totally get it. It's you know, part of your. Uh, position um, and your, your your kind of religious proclivity would be to want to help. Um, listen, Steve, we could talk much longer. We will speak again, I'm sure. Thank you for your time. That's Steve G. Jones. He's the news director at Article 18 with us here on Talk TV. Coming up after the break, we change gear. 1% deposit mortgages and changes to the leasehold system. Landlord expert Paul Champlina will be here with the latest property headlines. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Now, the Lords are currently debating the government's leasehold and freehold reform bill, which hopes to simplify the system of home ownership in most parts of the UK. Joining me to discuss this and more are the top housing and property headlines. Landlord expert, property expert, all-round good bloke, Paul Champlina. I don't know why they wrote that on there, Paul. Well, you know I'm a good bloke. bloke. You don't need to good. read that, Come Ian. Come on, I know, I know. <laughs> um, it's never a bad thing to reaffirm it. That's of what course. they say. Um, so the reform bill, um, it just explain what this is, because when people hear these headlines, even if they've got a vested interest, often people glaze over, because it's like, what does this even mean? So leasehold and freehold bill, uh, it was actually looking to be amended in the manifesto in 2019, along with the Renters Reform Bill. This was Go, yep. Go's showpiece saying, yep. I'm going to amend it, I'm going to look at uh, abolishing it and making it easier for homeowners. Actually, leasehold and freehold laws came in the dark ages. It was actually for wealthy landowners that would buy freehold, yep. and they would want to make sure that they can bring income in based on owning the land. And, of course, when you buy a leasehold property, you're buying a property which basically has a term, yes. i.e. 99 years, which is normally the norm. The problem that we're having now, and I even spoke to one of your makeup artists, she's got a problem, she owns a property. Yeah. She was paying seven years ago £170 a month for maintenance charges. That's now gone up to £750 a wow. month. Wow. Seven years later. So now what's happening is... So it's things like that. It's So the ground... The, what, what, what Gove's trying to do is he's saying ground rent... So by law, you have to pay a ground rent, and that has been increasing uh, fourfold every year, as well as the maintenance charges. So if you've got... I mean, 20% of the properties out there are leasehold. I mean, 59% in Greater London are leasehold, as you can imagine, in, in yeah, the yeah, cities, because yeah. obviously they're... These blocked. are apartments. You, they're apartments. Not always, but usually. They're, partner, they're apartments. But, of course, with those costs you get maintenance charges. Yep. So, obviously, there's management companies that will push up prices, possibly. You know, you've got gardening, you've got common parts, you've got insurance, you've got yep. ground... So, it's going up and up. And, it, and, of course, it all got looked at when Grenfell happened and, of course, the cladding issue. Yeah. Because everything went through the roof. So, it's going through the House of Lords. But the reality is is they think that it needs to be amended, and they are looking at amendments, but they won't, it won't be abolished, i.e. the free old leasehold, mm. because, by all accounts, pension funds would lose £40 billion yeah. off their, their shares and their pensions because they own so many freeholds. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. And so there's one of the problems there. So that's going to have a, a... And, of course, the Treasury like it as well. Of course they do. Yes. They love every bit of it. Yeah. Um, let's look at this 1% deposit um, idea that's, uh, that's out there. We have talked about this before. Yeah, a of couple course. of weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, we did. Um, so, what, what's the deal here? Is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? Well, it's... it's Yorkshire Building Society have announced a couple of days ago that you can put a £5,000 deposit down and borrow up to 99% of the value of the property, up to five. Hundred thousand pounds. So you get a half a million pound half house a by putting five grand down. You could, yes, but it's first time buyers only. It's not new builds and historic. And actually, it's a five year deal at five nine nine. Uh, but there's rigorous credit scoring okay. and of course affordability. So it's you know the, it, actually there was a research done by first time buyers uh, survey and seventy eight percent still think that owning a property is an elite privilege. Believe it or not. It's such a, a pipe How dream many? for a lot of people. Seventy eight percent. It's an elite of, because it's become so far out of reach. It, it's of such some it's people. such a pipe dream. Wow. You know, and actually sixty eight percent percent of um, of renters and first time buyers mm. actually believe that the UK are going to be in danger of being a nation of renters. Um, so well, the, it's just too expensive, isn't it? That's that's the problem. 
It's not the concept. It's not that this is a kind of left-wing moral argument, all property is theft or anything like that. No, cool. It's just the idea that it's out of reach for so many and people. And exactly. And unfortunately, it, it depends on what era you're born in, yeah. is, is the reality. I mean, we, we talked about it a few weeks ago when we bought our first properties. I paid, yeah, yeah. I paid a £40,000 for my first one-bedroom flat in North London. That was in 1938. That was 1938, it? prior yeah. to the war, so, yes. So, uh, of course, yes, yeah. you did I'm, I'm ageing very good did, with both Did all right there, didn't yes, you, Paul, really? Uh, yeah. But it is that problem of, you know, you, you'd have to... We'd have to have a sustained period of no growth in house prices and mm. rising wages for about 10 or 15 years yeah. before it would start to kind of I, I think, equal look, out. Look, I think there will be, because of what, obviously what's happened in the economy and, you know, I think, you know, we've got inflation down, which has been good, but obviously the cost of living is really expensive. Look, I think the reality is there is going to be some rate reductions yep. in the next few months, we hope, until the end of the year, sure. which obviously will breed confidence. But obviously, we've talked about this before, with people on fixed-term mortgages or going into first-time buyers uh, and, and locking in, to, you yeah, know, yeah. It, it, it's, it can be daunting. Of course. Yeah. Um, we've only got about a minute left, yes. Paul, but final story. It's a fun one, this. The fellow that bought a flat on a cruise ship. Is that right? Yes. Uh, Austin Wells, 28-year-old from San Diego, paid $300,000, which is about £246,000, for studio on a ship. Um, which is, uh, it, it's a studio where he's got featured a fold-away bed, a pantry, a desk, and he saves himself £500 a month from actually renting an apartment in San Diego. So, with his work pattern, he said it'd be great when I do my work and then I, in the daytime I can stop off at different cities. I mean, doesn't it take you eventually, like, you know, about 7,000 miles away from where you work or something? Well, yeah, but the, obviously he's a remote worker, naturally. So he I mean, can I'm do sure that. you worked that out, yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just a lovely <laughs> thought. can't commute on the tube but every day. He thought it was a good idea. Yeah. Great, but, I've but got it. He... And then he wakes up to discoveries in another country. Exactly. So th there's, I mean, the, the way of the world now. But the $300,000 he's paying is only for a 12-year lease. Ah. So he's renting them in for 12 years. 12 years. Back to the lease issue. Back again. to the lease issue, there yeah. It is. And all that. Uh, Paul, always good to see you. Later. Thank you. Paul Champlina with us here on Talk TV. Let's get a final word in from you on that question we began with the NHS. Kieran is in County Down. How are you doing, Kieran? Hello. Good afternoon. What are your thoughts? I just want to say about my experience in the NHS. Yep. In 2020, I had to go in for emergency spinal surgery okay and i was treated very well i ended up coming out of hospital about two weeks after that but i ended up losing my legs again my being able to walk so, so you need you needed I, subsequent treatment were you able to get yeah, that treatment and i ended, i got uh, another uh, uh, operation after that Wow. I spent four and a half months in four different hospitals. Man alive, you've been through the mill on this. What's your yes. overall satisfaction rate of the NHS, would you say, Kieran? Absolutely fantastic. Well, we began... months after I got out the first time of hospital, I broke my femur. I had my surgery the very next day. So you've, and it, it, there's nothing wrong with highlighting good stories because there are many of them out there. What I think the argument here is that we should have more of them in an ideal world. Kieran, you get the final word. Thank you, mate, for that. We've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Back tomorrow at three o'clock. Up next on Talk TV, the fantastic Vanessa Feltz is here. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to ab and an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out.
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would nice to put a statue of the Queen on the 